Okay, our session's being recorded. This is, of course, week 10 of our 12-week course in Data 610. And we're moving uh, into our second week with Big ML. Uh, again, that's a, uh, let me see if I, I need to mute anybody. It's not muted. Um, that's our second week with the uh, last software package in the course, Big ML. And I hope if you've been trying it out, you found it to be fairly easy to absorb. Again, it does one thing well, and that is decision trees. Now, there's, there's a very powerful use of decision trees because they're easy to understand, easy to implement, oftentimes fairly accurate. Uh, and of course, a lot of the settings are automated. You don't have to worry too much about missing data or at all. You don't have to worry about, you can have uh, both uh, uh, you know, categorical and numerical or interval variables. Uh, you don't have to worry about transforming your distributions, any of those things. So it's a very powerful and easy to use technique. And as we pointed out last week, by far the most popular. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. Uh, overview again, continuing the decision tree in general and then getting a little bit into some of the specifics. Um, now, there's only two weeks to this uh, segment because I'm, I'm, again, convinced this is fairly easy software to use. It's your third package. You're sort of catching on. The main uh, reminder I'd like to let everybody know is be sure to create a test set and a training set. Again, we, we build the models with the training set, but we evaluate the models on the test set. And, of course, with the categorical model, uh, such as a decision tree, you basically will be looking at um, the classification matrix. Uh, there's there's not a ROC, there's not an ROC curve capability in Big ML, but they will do it will do classification tables. The you know false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. So you get a feel for how accurate it is from that uh, aspect. Okay, so we're going to talk about this automated decision tree generator, and that's what it basically is. You give it a problem, and it, it gets this go. And then from that decision tree, we can get automated rules, okay? We remember we used prediction software for several weeks and we used, looked at Palisade software uh, in part of this segment showing you some tools for end users. I would consider this again an end user tool. Okay, back to business rules. As we said last week, a little bit of a recap, a little bit of a reminder. Uh, business rules really drive decisions. You can say, well, I like regression better. I like neural networks better. They may be more accurate. They're certainly more complex. They're much harder to operationalize, whereas business rules are easy to operationalize, and that's why there's so many of them. You run across them every day. If this, then that. You run across them in taxes. You run across them in policies. And now, of course, you're seeing how to use them for predictions, which is an aspect that, that a lot of businesses want to use them for. They want to have a rules embedded in their operational systems. Part of what uh, Mr. Davenport talks about, step three, operationalize your findings. Well, this is the easiest way to do that, and that's why we talk about it. Uh, we also discussed the two ways to build expert systems. One, more advisory in nature, comes from tapping into the experience and the tacit knowledge of your employees. Um, the other, a machine learning system, taps into past data and history where you have cases where you can identify the inputs and the answers and it will figure out the relationship. Again, the flow, the rules that tie those together. Very powerful. One is much more quick, much quicker. The uh, machine learning is much quicker. The other, more flexible, but they're for different purposes. Again, if I had to build a system to advise you how to repair a toaster, you know, if this is not working, then unscrew that. If that that doesn't fix it, then try new batteries, whatever. I would certainly build one from scratch using perhaps one of the systems I mentioned last week, Exus or LPA. Those are great. If, on the other hand, I'm trying to predict someone who will default on a loan, someone who will respond to a donor uh, solicitation, someone uh, who will likely to buy a certain product, then, of course, I have past data where I would use machine learning because it would be much faster to develop the system. So, different kinds of things. Again, the decision tree is the main way in which we build machine learning systems. Set of rules that deduce a goal. And again, the real power here, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this is a chart I think I've shown you before, showing that decision trees by far the most popular. 
Now, the real power is the ability of the software to figure out how to make these splits, as we call it. Again, when you get to data 640, we'll go behind the scenes and talk about the actual calculations of entropy and the GD index and things. But basically, here's what's happening. I, I, the decision tree software, will look at every single input and every single value of every single input and create this split. And then I'll look and see which of those values or which of those variables created more homogeneous pots in the next level down. In other words, this pot is a mix. This pot is a mix of yeses and noes, okay? I look for something that will put more of the noes over here and more of the yeses over here. And I look for the best possible split. So the real power of a decision tree machine learning algorithm is in fact its ability to look at every single variable and every single value of every single variable, find the best one and make that split, and then repeat it. Taking this pot, find the best one to split it, taking this pot, finding the best thing to split it, and so forth. Now, if you have dozens of variables or maybe even hundreds of variables, and each of those can take off dozens or maybe even tens of dozens of values, such as a continuous variable, then you're going to get a large number of possible evaluations. Yet it happens so quickly because of the power of our software these days that you really don't even realize what's going on. When you see big ML split the data and you, and you think, oh, I see it split on salary or it split on this or split on that, what you don't realize is behind the scenes, it checks every single value for every single variable and pick the best value for the best variable that puts the data into more homogeneous subpots sub under the big pot. Now, if it's a, something, if one of the variables is like gender, male, female, I want to check two things. Would male split the best or would, would, you know, would gender split the best if I put males over here and females over here? But what if the, what if it was salary? where it's, you know, in increments of $100 or something, and it doesn't, so let's check all of this. And it has to calculate the best one. So again, just a reminder, because it's very impressive when you know what's going on. Now, we have other methods for do, to do classification, as you know. Okay? We have decision trees, we have logistic regression, we have naive bays, we have neural nets, all very common tools, and there are others but all very common tools for doing classification problems. What's different from about decision trees versus the others? A couple of things. First of all, the others, mostly logistic regression, certainly in neural network, build functions with mathematical relationships. And in some cases, very complex functions. <laughs> logistic regression, uh, and we haven't covered much of this, but logistic regression coefficients are not really uh, the same as um, linear regression coefficients. They're, they're using a, a different kind of a function to get a probability that you belong to a certain class. Neural networks are even more complicated. A set of inputs going into a set of hidden layers, going into a, a squashing function or a transformation function coming out. And, so and again, we'll cover all that in data 640, so you'll have a real much better understanding. Suffice it to say right now, but again, these approaches will result in a function not easily implemented. In fact, the neural network is, is almost not even a function. It's a quasi-function at best. It is a mathematical relationship, but not really a function as we know x plus y plus z or something like that. Of course, logistic regression would be. But they're complex. They're hard to understand. They're hard to explain. They're hard to interpret. Decision trees. Does not decision trees do not build a complex mathematical function or a mathematical function at all. They build rules. They build models based on the importance of factors which are automatically determined. So you don't have to think too much or at all. You can dump all the factors in. If they're not important, they won't be used. Whereas with neural networks and regression, you have to be careful which factors you include. Factors are oftentimes not considered because they turn out not to be important and they're easily explained. Sometimes the decision trees do come out a little bit counterintuitive. I'm not saying they won't, but they certainly are relatively easy to grasp what happened. You may not agree with what happened, or you may not think 
that goes in line with your intuition. And then you can go back and take a look at the data and see why it happened. But it's based on past cases. So this is what happened. You may not like it or believe it, but this is what happened and so forth. Okay, strengths again. Easy to understand, rules versus equations. Easy to explain, not a black box. No one should be totally confused or even partially confused once they've looked at what came out of a decision tree. Data doesn't have to follow any distributions. It can handle interaction between variables. It can handle missing data. Very powerful. You say, well, why don't we just use that instead of other things? Well, it has weaknesses, okay? Not very good for continuous value predictions. It's much better much better for classification, okay? Now there is a way to handle uh, continuous value functions with regression trees, and that's what they're called, regression trees. But they basically use the mean as the, as the sort of stand-in value rather than the full distribution, so it's not near as good. Can be computationally expensive to train. You know, if I, if I were doing this slide in circa 19, or 2015, I'd be tempted to take that out because it, with the powerful software we have today, I'm not sure that this remains in the downside. Now, if you had a huge, huge number of past data cases and a huge number of potential possible val variables that could be used with a large number of values, maybe, but I'm not convinced. Can have problems if many cases and few training examples. As with uh, almost all predictive models, you'd like to have a lot of data taking on a lot of different values for each, of, for each of the variables so that you have a wide array of exemplars, as we call them, or cases. You'd like to have a lot of cases. You get a much better model if the, if the solution space or the possible solution space is well represented and well populated. And then this final one. Now, this one can be a bugaboo, overfitting. Uh, quite often, decision trees will overfit. What will happen is they will fit to extremes, all the way down to an individual case almost, and the rules will be so detailed and so complex that it makes it difficult, if not impossible, for the decision tree to generalize to new cases. Okay, So this can be a problem. We have a couple of ways of solving that. One way, of course, is to have a test set. Okay. I'll talk about that. So overfitting happens when it describes the noise or random error rather than the underlying relationship. Now this can happen in any kind of model. Any kind of predictive model can have overfitting, but decision trees are more prone to it because if they don't stop them, they will continue splitting the tree until they get down to where the bottom leaves, as we call them, on the trees, have basically one case in them which is ridiculous. It says if you find another case exactly like this and which may have 25 rule, steps to the rule, then this is what happened to that one case. How much confidence would you put in that? Not much. We have a couple of ways of dealing with that. Again, the primary way is to use the test data. You build the decision tree as you do with all predictive models on the training data, 75, 70, 80 percent of the data. You'd save 20 to 30 percent of the data out, called the test set. When the model is completed and built on the training data, you run it against the test data. Now we know the answers to the test data questions, so to speak, because again, it's past data. And so the model will make its prediction on each of the cases in the test set. You'll compare that to what really happened and you calculate the error term. That's how we get the classification table, the ROC curves. Or if it's a continuous variable, that's how we get average squared error, mean squared error, et cetera. Okay? So that's one way. Now, if there's a, a slight difference in the results of the two, and again, I've, I've said this before, if there's a slight difference, in other words, the test set is not quite as accurate, the results of the test set are not quite as accurate as the results on the training set, that's okay. What do I mean by slight? Well, that's a pretty subjective thing. Maybe a couple of percent difference. Maybe the test set is 80% accurate and the training, I mean, the training set is 82% accurate and the test set is 80% accurate. That wouldn't make me nervous. If the training set is 98% accurate and the test set is 75% accurate, aha, uh -huh, I've overfit. Now, with the software 
that we use for sort of end users, um, there's not a whole lot built in to do uh, to fix that other than go back and try perhaps a simpler model, a different kind of model, take out some of the, uh, you may have collinearity among the inputs, uh, you can try things. With the more advanced software, such as SAS Enterprise Miner that we use in Data640, there are built in things that will back it up and create sh shorter, smaller trees until they find the, the best set, uh, the best accurate model against the test set. You don't need to worry about that. Okay, you just need to be aware of this. So with large data sets, there's lots of noise, lots of randomness, no real cause and effect, just things happen. You know, when you have a large data set, you have millions and millions of records, there's going to be a few squirrely ones in there. One of the ways you could fix overfitting would be to go back and look for outliers and say, oh, these are probably causing the problem. Take some of those outlying outliers out or outlying values out, okay, because they will have an undue influence. You know, if, if, it's, if it's splitting on age and you have some people in there who are like 95 and everybody else is in their 20s, it can skew where it splits the, the set, okay? So that's, that's just background. This is background information. But the key thing is you do want to have a holdout test set, and you do want to compare the training set accuracy and the test set accuracy, and that's for any predictive model. So this is a little example right out of... Um, uh, an article by Fern Halper. Now, I think I've mentioned it before. When you see Fern Halper's name, pay attention. She is absolutely brilliant in terms of uh, analytics. Everything she says, I, I think, is worth paying attention to. She works at TDWI, the Data Warehouse Institute. They do some terrific free webinars, white papers, et cetera, on analytics. And they've got one coming up here in uh, a few weeks, I think, but I've watched several that Fern was the moderator or the main speaker for, not just the moderator, and they're excellent. So this was a little example. You know, we're trying to figure out whether somebody's going to defect or not. Uh, you know, you, you'd like to make sure that they, you know, if they leave, that's a yes, and if they don't leave, that's a no. So let's say you start splitting, and you first notice the split on the total deposits. Well, that makes sense, okay? Customer puts in more than 4K a month, and is using online bill pay for more than two years, not likely to leave. And of course, you get probabilities associated with this right out of being unknown. However, if they've used online banking for less than two years and called the call center X times, then they may be more likely to leave. And remember, and remember, an important aside, some people still say, oh, when I ran my model, it didn't come up with a 100% probability prediction that someone's going to defect or leave or churn. No. All we're trying to do is improve on what you could do without the model. If all you, have, all you can do is guess without the model and you can do a better job with the model, then you've got a successful model. And then it goes on, conversely, customers and doing a lot of deposits and has made a lot of calls, blah, 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 blah. Here's a point of overfitting. You could end up with a rule like this if, you don't, if you're not careful. A rule with 97%. If a customer deposits more than 4K a month, has used online bill pay for more than two years, lives in XYZ, and is greater than six feet tall, they will leave. So that's clearly a decision tree that has gone down to a level of specificity that's going to make it difficult to generalize. And you're going to get a lot of sparse predictions, and it's not going to do well on the test set. Okay? So you don't need to worry about that. You just need to make sure you have a test set, build on the training set, test the model on the test set, do the evaluation on the test set, which is built in the big ML, Take a look at the um, at the um, classification matrices you get for the training and test set, and hopefully the results will be close. Okay, so let's talk a bit more about the Big ML software. I hope you've had by now an opportunity to look at some of the webinars that they do and some of the tutorials. They're quite good. People say, "Well, I'd like to have a, a manual of documentation." Well, you don't have one for this software, and I don't think you need one. Pass. Uh, student uh, sections have, have seemed to think this was one of the few software packages you can learn by just watching the tutorials, going through, doing a practice problem or two. And of course, they have these webinars, which are delightful in explaining the many, many features that are in the software. I do not, do not expect you to try to use all of the features or even many of the advanced features. You can try them if you wish. 
but basically I'm trying to expose you to the basics. The basics are it can build a decision tree model. You can run queries against the model. You can, tra you can download the actionable code in one of many formats. Uh, and then if you glean insights, that's fine. Those are the basics for the tasking for this assignment. If you look at the guidance, you'll see that's pretty much what's laid out. If you want to try ensemble models, if you want to compare your decision tree model that you build with big ML to one that you could go back and build with prediction, fine. If you want to try uh, any of the clustering or some of the other features, fine, but they're not part of the tasking for the assignment. Tasking for the assignment is just to build a, a decision tree model, run a couple of queries to make sure you see how it works, and so forth. And of course, my little walkthrough should give you a good example of that. I built that uh, my first semester using Big ML, and I looked at it a couple of times in the last day or two, and it still looks pretty good for the basics. Okay, so let's get back to Big ML briefly. A standalone program. No one here <laughs> didn't have to install anything, didn't have to do anything other than register with the company. And you should note that your uh, use of that software is free forever as long as your uh, data file is 16 megs or less. It's pretty nice, pretty generous. So you can do a lot with this. You may want to use it later on somewhere down the line in the program here. It runs in the cloud, runs quite quickly, usually. It's got a unique approach, again. The only thing it does well, well, it does do clustering, but the thing it does well is create these decision trees, generate rules, let them be exported. And then, of course, the thing they added within the last year, the idea of creating ensembles. And I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Some of those galleries are pretty impressive. If you look at those galleries, uh, I can open those real quick for you. In fact, if you look at the uh, predictive uh, BML galleries, you see some very fancy and large tree. Kickstarter project outcomes, predicting this, whether a Kickstarter will succeed or not. Telephone churn. Now, there is a very complex churn model. And now that you know what's going on in this, this is the decision tree. Of course, you can download and zoom and, and take a look at these. Text classification. I don't think that one's ready for prime time yet. Uh, text classification is very difficult to do. And so forth. Survey of patients' hospital expense. So these are some of the models that are far beyond what most of you will want to create for this class <laughs> until you get more comfortable. If you choose to continue using Big ML, that's great. These are not, these are well above what uh, we will be doing, but they're very interesting to look at once you feel comfortable with the model. Again, I think on that first assignment, a few people tried to say, well, I'm going to go out and get the world's largest data set and, and cleanse it and transform it and build complex models. And that's really fine if you're comfortable with it. But if this is your first foray into this stuff, you better stick with some very uh, much less complex approaches. Okay, let's go back to wherever I was here. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, so let's say a little bit about ensemble. Now, this is not something that's part of the required assignment, but here's what's nice about ensembles. You already know by now that we have lots of different kinds of models we can build. We can build a neural network model, we can build regression models, we can build decision trees, we can build naive based, we can build models with those techniques, slightly changed for classification or for prediction, i.e. continuous variables. We can build multiple models of each type. We can use different sets of inputs, et cetera. However, there's another whole category of models <laughs> called ensembles. What are they? Well, ensembles are basically multiple models. You know, you're combining models. There's Adaboost, there's Random Forest, and there's others. We're not going to cover any of those in detail in this course. Suffice it to say that oft times, oft times, an ensemble model will turn out to be more accurate than any individual model. It's a group of models that sort of average their results, if you will. One kind of ensemble model, one kind, is called a random forest. What it is, is a bunch of decision trees built from the same set of data, and then the results average. 
Now you might be thinking, and, and it would be the proper way to think, how can I build multiple models when the decision tree decides which variables are important and builds it automatically? I don't have any choice in that. If you are using the ensemble approach in Big ML, it does not use the entire data set to build the decision tree. It samples from the decision from the data set. So let's say you've got 10,000 cases. It might pull 6,000 cases in, build a decision tree, put those 6,000 cases back, pull another 6,000 in. Of course, some of those will be the same, but it'll build a second decision tree by pulling 6,000 in again randomly, build a second tree, put the 6,000 back. So we always, end, we always end up with the total number of cases available, and we're pulling out a certain percentage of them and building a decision tree. And we're building multiple trees. They'll all be similar, but not exactly the same, as you can imagine. When you're pulling a random selected subset of data from the large data set, you obviously don't get the same cases each time, and so the models are not exactly the same each time. They'll split on slightly different values at slightly different points, and maybe even slightly different variables. So now let's say you do the default in Big ML, which is to create a 10 uh, tree ensemble. Again, that's called a random forest. Well, now what do I do? Well, when you get to the predictions, you put in the, the numbers. Remember, once we build a model and say, and we test it and say, yeah, that's pretty good. Now I'm going to use to predict some things. So now we put in the person's name, rank, serial number, whatever the factors are, and the model predicts whether or not, let's say, they'll churn. Well, if you have 10 models, each of the models will predict whether or not the person will churn. Some might say yes, some might say no, okay? And they'll certainly say yes or no with different confidences. So what will happen um, is that each model will make a prediction, like it says right here, and each model will have its own confidence level because it will have flow, flowed down a different path. And then the final prediction, whether or not you think the person's going to churn or not, is a combination of how the models predicted it. You have several ways to do it. The default will be a plurality. So if I have 10 models, six of them predict the person will not default, four of them predict the person will, the ultimate answer would be they will not default. Or I can weight the models depending on which ones I think are better models because of the confidences. Or I can weight them by the distribution of classes in each tree. Okay, because again, they'll be slightly different pulling these 6,000 out. Or I can set a threshold that says, you know, I'm not going to predict a person's going to default on a loan or going to churn unless eight out of 10 models agree with that, or seven out of 10 models. You set the threshold. So this is giving you a lot of flexibility, but it's really quite straightforward. Now, oft times, as I said, an ensemble model, this is just one kind of an ensemble model. There's, there's other kinds, bagging and Attaboost, which we don't cover in this course, nor can either of those be done with big ML. Um, but ensembles are oftentimes more accurate than individual models. What's the downside? Well, the ease of explaining that was inherent in the decision tree pretty much disappears with an ensemble. <laughs> Yeah, you can explain any one tree, but try explaining why you have 10 trees that are all different and try explaining why you selected one of these criteria to combine those 10 trees and you begin to add a certain level of obfuscation to your, to your ability to explain that. Nor can I download a simple set of rules and turn it into an operational procedure because which tree do I use? They all have rules, but they're all different, slightly different. But different. So I've lost the ease of implementation, I've lost the ease of explainability, and I've gained what? Accuracy, perhaps. So if you get a, a substantial bump in accuracy, that trade-off might be worth it. Now I'm giving all of you, I'm giving you all of this as an aside. Some of you may want to try on samples, you may be intrigued by it, you may have enough time to do it, but again, it's not a requirement. But I think it's important to have a little bit of a grasp early on about ensemble. And so this is sort of a sidebar, the pros and cons of ensembles, but they are easy to do, at least the, the random parse is easy to do in big ML.
Further, as I pointed out last week, Big ML has an outstanding blog. Okay, outstanding. Probably one of the best blogs ever. And so if you um, if you go to Big ML and uh, and look at their uh, uh, blog, I should have the link in here, but I don't at the moment. If you go to the Big ML blog, you can actually find uh, a very good blog on random forest in there. Okay, remember they publish all those things. So if I move the participants out of the way here for a moment and search on random forest, uh, we should come right up. I hope to that. Um, very good. Here we go. Okay, so if you say, well, this Kano didn't explain that very well, then go read this, this random parse explanation here because it's quite good. Multiple models with different subsamples of your data and so forth. And you can go back and read the previous post about how this works. Uh, here's how to create the ensembles and a little bit more on other kinds of ensembles, diving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So again, uh, I think it's important that you have a little background on the ensemble. It is not part of the assignment required for the minimum tasking, but I think it's kind of intriguing that they added that about uh, a year or so ago and made it really easy to do, and it's a very powerful feature sometimes. Okay, so again, you predict with ensembles, you'll end up with, as it shows here, the, the default is to build 10 models. When they put in the status for this particular new case, this is a new case, not one of the cases out of the training set. Here comes a new person in, and we're trying to predict whether they're going to pay a loan back or not. Because that's the whole purpose of this model, this uh, decision tree, was to try to say, can we predict whether a person will pay a loan back or not before we give them the loan, preferably. So you can see out of the 10, one, two, three, four, five, six predicted they would pay it back. One predicted default bankruptcy, one predicted charge off, default bankruptcy, default settled uh, out of court or settled somehow, settled somewhere. By the way, <coughs> this particular example is from one of the Kaggle competitions. Now, again, if you haven't visited Kaggle, I've mentioned a couple of times that you might want to go visit Kaggle. Kaggle is a neat website. People who have real problems put them out there and say, hey, you can fix this, build a good model, I'll give you some money. So you can see there's 671 teams trying to win this 100 grand from diabetic retinopathy detection. Seven days to go. Coupon purchase prediction, 50,000, 112 teams, and so forth. So what you're looking at when you look at this ensemble model was actually uh, an example of big ML people trying to win one of the Kaggle competitions. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. They didn't, but they didn't only took a few minutes to build their model instead of days and agonizing over it. And if they'd done longer, who knows, they probably could have. Okay, what else do we need to worry about? Well, uh, as we've talked about, one of the problems that can occur with classification problems is the 991 problem, where so many of the cases result in one answer that it skews the ability of the decision tree to really do a good job. If you don't like the way your model's coming out, especially, let's say again, 10,000 cases and 9,900 of them uh, are people who did not churn and only 100 did. Well, it's going to predict nobody's going to churn pretty much. And of course, that's not what you want. You want to identify the people who are likely to churn. So you may have to go in and again, this is an advanced thing, not part of what I expect you to do, but you may have to go in and weight some of the underrepresented cases heavier, okay? To balance, especially for classification models. It oftentimes will give you a more accurate model for predicting the underrepresented cases. Again, if you had all these cases where the rate, the payment, the status, and these are the inputs and here's the answer, and all of a sudden it sees case, 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 and they all look roughly the same, okay, it starts gaining confidence. It says, oh, I've seen one case like this. I've seen two. I've seen three. I've seen a thousand. So it starts saying I'm 99.5% sure. Then here comes along a case looks very similar, looks identical, but it doesn't. 
person didn't pay the loan back. Well, that will lower the uh, confidence a little bit if it's included in the training set, obviously. But what if default is more important that occurs less often than paid, such as here? This is the case I really wanted to find. I don't care about all these characters. That's great that they paid the loan back. I was really trying to find this one. Well, you may have to go in and wait those cases or those, they call them classes, uh, higher. Okay. So you can do that. Again, an advanced feature. You can go in and say, well, I'm going to put a much heavier weight on the class outcome. Class meaning no or yes. I'm going to put a much heavier weight on the no's. I want to count those as much more important. Or in this case, I want to count the, uh, the defaults as much more important. When they say class, they mean an outcome, a target, one of the target variable outcomes. So you can do that. Okay. You can do it several ways. You can specify weights for each instance, each case. You can say this case is worth 10 times what it looks like. Or you can specify weights for each class outcome. Or you can go in and simply multiply the smaller classes, the ones that don't occur often, just duplicate them. Boom, 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 boom. And then we'll do that. Okay. Again, extra features. Some of the useful features that are in there, the support statistics. Sometimes students will ask, what's the support statistic? Well, it's the number of times that something occurred. Now, if you say, gee, I don't, I don't really put much faith in something that only occurs once in a while, well, then you can change that threshold and set limits. So if something only occurs one out of 100, or we don't even pay attention to it, or one out of 50, or one out of 10. I mean, it's up to you. So it allows you to see where the bulk of the cases are. Again, with decision trees, oftentimes there are ways of stopping the tree from being built by saying, I want at least so many cases in each leaf. Otherwise, it's, it's too rare to worry about, or I only want to go down a certain number of levels or various things. This is one way in big ML. For large data sets, you might only want to use a sample of the data set. I, I doubt. I doubt if any of you are going to use a data set too large for big ML to include the whole thing. But if you do, you can do that. Filters. You can filter, set filters so that when you bring the data set in, the source, and create a data set, you only uh, adjust, you look at just the cases you want to use. So you can highlight cases. You can also set limits on the ranges of values and outliers. You can add fields to the data sets. You can normalize. So you can do a lot of things beyond beyond the scope of what the task means for this assignment, but just to give you a feel for all the features. I don't want you to think big ML can't do these things. It can. We won't use it. Uh, okay, now again, some of the ways we stop the decision tree from overfitting and going too far is pruning. You know, the default is to stop in what we call statistical pruning. In other words, quit adding branches when there is no statistically significant feature added. And it's using a, usually a chi-square or an F-test, depending on what kind of thing we're doing, okay? There are other pruning options. You know, stop when, when there's no more than 10 cases in a leaf or something. Stop after six levels. So there's a lot of features there. There's something called a secret link. When you, you know, this won't benefit you much in this course, but it might if you use this in the real world. If you build a model, that you want someone to look at, but not ready to include that in the marketplace or make public, you can have the secret link. I mean, other people can use the model, test the model, and they don't even have to have a big ML account. Finally, there's text analysis. Now, I said this wasn't quite ready for prime time, in my opinion. I don't think, if you go look at the webinar that was done showing how they do text analysis, that it's quite there yet. This is the holy grail, of course. If you can ever get one of the one of the uh, analytical packages to do a great job on unstructured data, which would include text, video, audio, pictures, then of course you really have something. Okay, the ability to analyze and do things with unstructured uh, data is, is, is giant size because about 85% of our data is unstructured. So big ML, give them credit. They're taking a shot at it. You you might want to look at the webinar just out of curiosity. You certainly aren't going to do text analysis uh, in this course. You know, you're welcome to try it. It's, it's there. 
but basically it tries to, you know, count the frequencies of certain words, focus on STEM words, uh, build a word cloud. It's kind of neat, but, you know, that doesn't really get me to where I need to be with text analysis yet. Okay. Now, I mentioned a couple of times already that you want to measure the accuracy, evaluate, they call it in BML, the accuracy of your model. And you're going to do that with a confusion matrix or classification matrix, it's sometimes called. And we've talked about this before back in week five or six. You know, we basically look at the number of cases that were negative and positive, because remember this is past data. And we compare that to what was predicted negative and positive. So the ones on the diagonal here are correct. These are true negatives. They were negative and they were predicted negative. These are true positives. They were positive, and they were predicted positive. These are wrongs. They were negative, but they were predicted to be positive, so they're false positives. These were positive, but predicted to be negative, so they're false negatives. So this is what Big ML will give you. You want to compare your training set and your test set. If you build multiple models, you certainly want to compare the confusion or the classification matrices for all the models. That's one of the primary ways we compare classification charts. The other is the ROC curve, which is not in big enough. And of course, there's several measures that come out of this. One is the overall accuracy. How well did it do? The total percent it got right divided by, I mean, the total number got right divided by the total number. So these are correct and these are correct. So we'd have 410 divided by uh, 500. Okay. The, predict, the um, precision. It's the percent of the positive ones that were correct, okay? So in that case, it would be uh, 50 <clears throat> divided by 50 plus 30, okay? Okay, and then recalls percent of the positive cases that were caught. 50 divided by 50 plus 60. Okay, these, depending on the problem, these will have uh, importances for picking a particular model. Now, we don't do enough of that in this course. I'm going to try to figure out a little better way to do more of it because if you have business implications, like there is a large penalty cost for a false positive or a false negative or a large payoff for a true positive or something like that, then it turns out that the precision and recall become much more important. It is possible, and I showed you this back in week six, it's possible to have a model whose overall accuracy is less than another model but whose uh, accuracy on specificity or sensitivity is so good in terms of limiting the number of false positives, false negatives, that it actually is better from a cost basis or a profit basis. You don't need to do that with this assignment either. Okay, a great article, again, from the blog at Big ML, predicting with my model, is it safe? Okay, if you go to this link, and I'll do that also, uh, you can see it's another a great blog entry, okay, talking about how to evaluate uh, your model, okay. And remember, uh, you want to have a test set and a training set. You want to compare those and so forth. So a very good blog entry there. Talks about the measures of accuracy. Okay, now you should start to get familiar with this layout now. The, the sort of tree diagram, because it is a decision tree. We start with the entire data set here, and then again, behind the scenes, the software looks at every single variable that is possible to split on, and every single value of every single variable that's possible to split on, and picks the best one, but takes this blob of cases and splits them better into more homogeneous units. Then it does it again and again and again and again, stopping when it reaches one of those stopping criteria that we talked about. You can say, I don't stop when you have a certain minimum number of cases in the final nodes, or stop when there's no statistically significant split, or stop when you've gone down X number of levels, et cetera, et cetera. You can try various things. And again, I would encourage you to try many things. The thicker the branch in terms of the width of the line, the more cases went that way. Okay. So what are we trying to do? Now let me go to, uh, here's a model that I built uh, for a different purpose on churning, okay? Trying to determine if a person's going to churn or not. Now when we start here, 
just to give you an idea if you're still a little confused about how this works. We start here, we have 1,667 total cases, okay? And 83.96% of them did not churn. So let's call it 84% and say 6% of this total of 1,667 uh, cases did churn. So if you had to guess uh, when you pulled a new case out of there or one of the cases out of there and didn't know the answer and had to guess whether they churned or not, what would you guess? You'd guess they did not churn. And how accurate would you be? About 84% accurate because 84% of the time they don't churn. So you can see the first split is on day minutes. When we go down this way, you will notice that the uh, proportion, remember, remember the, the no's, the no's did not churn. The yeses did. When we get down here, guess what? We now have uh, 77 out of 127 instances that did churn. So we have, instead of having uh, about a 16% confidence that a person churned, if we pull them out of this set, if, they, if they're down here where the uh, day minutes that they used were more than 260.86, we would be 52% confident that they churned. And if we go down here, where the day minutes were more than 260.86 and no voicemail plan, we're now 68 plus percent confident that they would churn because they did in the past. Now you'll notice we're getting fewer and fewer cases, but we're getting more confidence. If we go down here, 85 percent confident these people churn. People who had more than 260.86 day minutes, no voicemail plan more than 176.31 evening minutes, 85% of them, almost 86% of them churned in the past, but it was only 68 cases and so forth and so on. We get down here, people who did all of those things on the right went down the entire path. We are 94% confident that they will churn. So if we're gonna predict a person uh, um, doing that, then of course we'd be 94% confident. Not everybody, but 94%. And likewise over here, these are the people who don't churn. We started out, remember, we started out 84% confident that a person wasn't going to churn. Well, if we go over here where they spent less, used less than 260.86 minutes, we're now 87.92% they wouldn't churn, and so forth. You can see our confidence grows as we begin to get features. So what happens? These become rules, okay, that we can export. Okay, we'll come back to that in a second. Now, some useful features that I don't think uh, you're going to have any opportunity to do, but just to mention to you, because I want you to understand this is a very progressive company. They added clustering. Actually, let me say that. I'll come back to that. So here's an example. This is for late payments, on-time payments. Uh, again, uh, car loans, I think. And so when you get it all built, you will have the tree. You can then go and, and do some queries, okay? And what will come up is the questions that you need to be asking, because this is a rule. It says if this and this and this, and yeah, this, if this and this and this and this and this and this and this are true, I'm pretty sure they're gonna be late. I don't see, well, 76% confidence. So what do you do? And you say, show me the, let, let me try one. Let me try it, do a trial. So it says, what's the first question? And you put in salary, and you put in loan amount, and then you put in loan amount, and these are numbers I put in, whether they own or not their house, how old they are, and it comes back and says, uh, I predict late payment with 79% confidence. You can build these smart forms automatically. They will be automatically generated in Big ML. And then, of course, that makes it very usable. However, you can also export export the actual code in about 20 different formats. Okay. Uh, again, if you notice back here, well, I don't, I don't think I finished this model yet, but you can download uh, actionable. Uh, you can ask question by question. That was a prediction thing. And, of course, you can get more info, and you can download actionable code. Okay, uh, this is a model summary report, which you can also download. That's a model summary report. Download actionable code 
in one of these many languages. Lisp, JSON, Tableau, which I know you have some familiar with. Rules, that's what I did. I did rules and I did plain old text rules. JSON, PML, PMML, Python, Ruby, Objective-C, Java, Node.js, C Sharp, MS Excel, VBNet, VBS. You can download the code directly and put it right into your software that your organization is using. So I downloaded, I downloaded rules just as text for an example, and I put it right into my uh, PowerPoint here. Then I went in with these answers. So if you go back and check these answers, um, 32,680, 32,850 for the uh, salary. 32,670 for the loan amount. They own their own house, okay? And they're 40 years old. And it said uh, they're gonna be late payment likely, okay? Pretty sure, 79% sure they're gonna be late payment. So I downloaded all of the rules. Then I went in and highlighted in red the rules that were actually firing. That's a term for executing. When we talk about rule-based systems. So the rules that were actually firing based on those answers. Okay, so my first, it says, if salary is less than 41,560, I put in 32,850, so it is, and loan amount greater than 16,777, and I put in 32,670, so it is, so we keep going, and housing equals own, and I said, yes, they own their house, and salary greater than 22,5, yes, keep going, and if salary is greater than 36, well, it wasn't. It was 32,850. So it skipped that and out and skipped that. And they said, well, then the salary less than 36,000. It's not greater. It must be less than. Yes, it is. And if age is greater than 45, nope. Skip, 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 skip. Is age less than 45? Yes. Loan amount greater than 23,4? Yes. It was 32,670. Then late payments. Now, it's only going to ask the question about loan one time. It's only going to ask the question about salary one time because it remembers the answers that were put in. But you can see how it's sort of falling through this, this waterfall until the rules that were actually firing based on the answers that were put in uh, reach a conclusion. So it's going to keep going until we get one of the answers, one of the results from our target variable. We only had three, late, on time, or default in this case. So just an example of how that worked. So those were the things I put in, and that's how it came out. You can also have all of the questions on one form. Pros and cons of this. If they're all on one form, it's quicker, because you can say, okay, I'm just going to move these slider bars to the end and pull, pull down menus. Well, what if they were 50 questions or 30 questions, and you only need to answer three to get a result? Well, then this form would be a little cumbersome. Okay? But there, if you put those answers in, you get the same thing. Okay, before we go to the tips, let me go back and talk about some of these really, really, really advanced features that were added. I should have had my slides in a different order, but that's okay. All right, so these were added basically last year, <laughs> okay? First of all, they added probably one of the world's best clustering algorithms. Just to read and watch the example on how they clustered all different types of whiskeys will give you a much better feel for the value of clustering. I know this was a somewhat murky area based on some of the assignments that were handed in. People did clustering or segmentation. It's often called the same thing or the same thing. And they, and they said, gee, I did this, but I don't know how it helps me or anything. If you watch the spring or summer 2014 webinar where they go through in great detail a clustering example, you'll see there's some value there, okay? Some value there. In fact, they now have added to this. <laughs> what they've added to this, and again, I'm throwing this out just for info. I'm trying to absorb this. I'm not expected to do clusters. Uh, they now have added a feature which will take the clusters once they're built and discern from them the rules that are putting things into each of the clusters. Now, that has value. Now, if I end up with four clusters, and I know they're different because otherwise you wouldn't have things in each of them, right? You belong to cluster one because you're like all the other things in cluster one, and you don't belong to cluster two because there's something about all you characters in cluster one that makes you different than cluster two and so forth. Well, what is it? Sometimes that's hard to discern. So they now have a feature which will, will pull out, tease out the rules 
that cause cluster one to be what it is and the rule that cause cluster two to be what it is, et cetera. That's pretty powerful. I've got to do a lot more investigation of that before I'm ready to say too much more about it, but it looks impressive. Looks impressive. Uh, missing splits, uh, you know, if you have missing values, it, it really doesn't screw up decision trees, but if you want to filter out missing values, you can. Faster ensembles. One of the downsides of ensembles is, of course, it takes more time, especially if you have a large data set because you're sampling and building a model, putting everything back, sampling and building another model, putting everything back, et cetera. And finally, anomaly detection. Okay. Um, detecting things that are so weird they don't really fit into a cluster or they're so unusual that they really may not belong in the data set is not always as easy as it may seem to say, well, I'll just get rid of the people who are three or four sigma off the norm. That's not always the way to do it. So this anomaly detection is a big deal according to them and they've added that feature. So the clusters, again, is pretty neat how they figured out how to do that. And so I'll let you take a look at that webinar if you're curious. Okay, so now we're back on uh, track here. All right, so tips. Start with a small data set. Again, some of you uh, tried a little bit too ambitious in some cases. You know, you need to have a comfort zone that says, I really understand this. And that, and that is built easier with a small data set than it is with a large data set. Once you've done that with a small data set, you want to take on something bigger, that's great. Try to gain some insights into the rules by making some predictions. Uh, what are the insights you might gain? Well, sometimes you say, gee, it only took two questions to get an answer, and I had thought it was going to take 10 questions. Or that tells you which questions are more important, doesn't it? One of the insights you get is which of the, just like with the influencers, you sort of got a feel for which of the input variables was the most correlated with the output. When you look at the first thing that it's split on in the decision tree, that tells you that thing did the best job of divvying up the, the overall data set into two homogeneous pots. Okay, so that's a very important variable, isn't it? You might, if you have time, want to compare the decision tree you build in Big ML with the same thing, go back and build a decision tree in prediction on the same data set and see if you get the same answer. <laughs> Every algorithm has its own little ways of tweaking things slightly different, so they probably won't be exactly the same. Are they the same? Which one works better? Which is more accurate? An idea. You could try the cluster technique, but again, don't, don't, don't do any of this until you're comfortable with the basics. Um, you will have to develop a model with a training set and test set and take a look at the confusion engines. That's the, that's the middle. Yeah. And then gain some insights, try a couple of predictions, download at least a portion of the code in one format that you think would be useful for your organization, and perhaps comment on whether you think decision trees would be a useful tool for your organization. Okay, public models. So that's your assignment for week 10. You will submit the assignment at the end of week 10. This is the beginning of week 10, so next Sunday. Uh, it's the deadline, and then of course you'll have one more assignment due at the end of week 12. And we'll start talking about that when we get to week 11. Um, you're basically going to go back and, and fully frame a problem using Decision First software, at least first in the program, this time on an individual basis for a real problem in the organization, and I'll say a lot more about that next week. Again, these are the webinars. They're all quite good. They're anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes each. And of course, they have the tutorials. All right, we're up that last slide, as you now recognize the last slide, and that says, as it always does, if you have questions you want to ask right now, you can. Uh, anytime during the week, of course, you can post questions in any of the discussion areas where they're appropriate. So let me have any questions as a good one for general questions that uh, the answer to which would benefit all. And of course, as many of you have already done, you can email me or call me for any kind of uh, personal questions, help, or whatever. Okay, so let me stop there for a moment, see if any questions show up. Uh, I see only a, a light turnout tonight, which is fine. Again, people have a lot going on. 
And I understand that. That's why I record the sessions. We have people in different time zones. We have people with different uh, requirements for uh, family matters and or business matters, uh, illnesses, etc. So uh, again, no extra credit for those who do attend live and no penalty for not attending live. All right, well, what I'm going to do is stop sharing. I always do that first. And then I'm going to stop the recording and post the link, as always, as soon as I have it.